Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for taking the time and joining us. My name is Megan Lung. I'm an environmental analyst with the Hudson River Estuary Program. And for those of you who may not be familiar with our program, we are a non-regulatory program of DEC dedicated to the Hudson River Estuary Watershed. Um, and specifically, we can offer technical assistance and funding opportunities for dam removal um, planning and actual deconstruction. So I'd like to first talk briefly about um, we have a um, tributary restoration resiliency RFP that we've traditionally been able to fund this kind of work. And my apologies for the sun. I am joining you live from the Five Rivers parking lot in Delaware, New York. Um, but with that grant, we've been able to offer um, planning and engineering uh, resources for dam, remo for dam removal. Um, for the actual implementation, there are some statewide resources such as the Water Quality Improvement Program. There is a category that is devoted specifically to aquatic connectivity. So things like dam removal and culvert mitigation would fall under that. And then lastly, there, we do have a PDF resource that I believe you'll be getting after the webinar. There is an absolute ton of federal funding available with the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, there, um, the funding can range from technical assistance to planning to actual deconstruction. And I'd just like to touch on one example of that. Um, our partners at Riverkeeper, who have been absolutely instrumental in doing this dam removal work and getting a lot of the momentum started in the Hudson River Valley, have been successful in getting a grant from the uh, NIFWIP, which is the National Foundation for uh, Wildlife Fund. Um, they are going to be getting a grant to work in the Quasea Creek and also hopefully some other ones once we hear back from the larger NOAA funding source. But that PDF is gonna be available. It's gonna be mailed out to you. It's really dense. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us and we would love to help you sort through it and find some opportunities to bring some more federal funding to the Valley. And with that, I will turn my video off and hand it back over to you, Emily. Great, thanks so much, Megan. And uh, the PDF was just added to the chat and we'll be sending that out uh, with an email to all of our participants afterwards as well. So next up, I'd like to introduce Michael Fratz from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. All right, let me get my uh, screen video here. You guys see me okay? And we'll do the share. All right. And... All right, can you guys see that okay? All right. Well, first off, thank you guys for having me today. I appreciate the opportunity to, to fill in some folks a little bit more about what we do um, or what I do at the DEC and uh, related to the dam removal. Um, the, you know, we, we don't have a lot of these projects in our region. I'm in region three in our New Paltz office right off of the throughway, um, but we have seen a few of them over the past few years and um, you know, hopefully we can see more. So the project I'm going to talk about today um, is in the village of Washingtonville, which is in Orange County. Um, it is, I believe it's within the town of Blooming Grove. So they kind of work in unison with one another. And the dam that um, was, was proposed to be removed was on the Moodna Creek, which is a pretty large um, body of water uh, in, in Orange County. Um, so just a little bit about me first before we dive into the project. Um, I am a biologist with our Bureau of Ecosystem Health. Um, they were formerly known as the Bureau of Habitat. We are under the Division of Fish and Wildlife uh, within DEC. Um, our, our role uh, mostly is as technical staff uh, regarding projects that involve Article 24, which is our freshwater wetlands law, Article 15, which is our protection of waters law, and uh, 401 water quality certifications, which is a joint permit between DEC and the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, I personally have been with DEC for six and a half years and I cover Orange, Sullivan and Rockland counties and also do a lot of work with um, our major utility projects that come through the region. Um, one thing that you'll probably get an idea of as I work through this is that um, we as the biologists in ecosystem health, we work a lot with Division of Environmental Permits. So the project that you're gonna um, hear about today uh, what did receive all the proper permits from us, and that was basically how um, I, I became involved in reviewing the project in relation to our state regulations and laws. Um, another just fun fact of what we do um, as biologists in ecosystem health, we um, conduct wetland delineations for state regulated wetlands across the region. 
Um, we also deal a lot with stream projects, as you're about to find out. And then um, we do a lot with our environmental conservation officers in terms of enforcement matters um, for all of the issues that we um, that deal with wetlands and streams. So as I said, the project um, that we're going to talk about today is located in the village of Washingtonville, which is in Orange County. There's a, a small little dot there just for reference. Um, here's a nice overhead view of the village. Um, you can see on the left hand side there is the Moodna Creek. Um, I don't know if you guys can see my, I'm going to do a pointer, but there is a, um, uh, the creek runs basically through the village. Um, so there are a number of businesses and homes that um, share, you know, backyards um, go right up to the creek. And um, there are like a number of major roads that bridges cross the creek. Route 208 is one of those. Um, so this is the site of the project that we're going to talk about today. Um, so the creek is obviously up to the northern side. Um, the, the walking bridge um, to the on the left hand side of the photo is um, is is a public walking bridge that was actually in this this last photo you can see here. This is the walking bridge um, to the on the bottom right left hand side of the screen. And then so now we're um, looking at this baseball field setup that is known as Mays Field. Um, it's home to like a bunch of the, the town little league teams and there's a couple other commercial businesses that, that use some of the space um, in, in the field area. So just keep this picture in mind and um, we'll have a bunch of other pictures too. Um, so if you see the parking lot, public parking is down here by the entrance um, off of the main road and there's a couple fields and then there's a playground over um, on the right hand side that is pretty close to the creek. And then the dam, it's a little hard to see in this photo, but it's underneath the green, um, green shaded area. That's basically our, our limits of disturbance that we're going to talk about today. Um, just for reference, um, you know, this, this project, one important thing to know is that it was really um, for, for flood mitigation. Um, this is how it came to us. It, it is not a priority for um, aquatic organism passage, but I think one takeaway that we're, we'll talk about later is that they kind of work hand in hand with each other. Um, this is a shot of the FEMA floodplain map. I thought it was important for everyone to see this. The blue is the actual floodway. So that's kind of the, the most frequently flooded area. The lighter pink um, is the 100 year storm um, floodplain or flood zone. And the darker pink is the 500 year flood zone. So basically the entire um, baseball field and park and many of the businesses nearby are all within um, those areas. So here's a picture of the dam before it was removed. Um, this was from March 2020, and the project uh, wasn't didn't get constructed or didn't get um didn't get started until the fall of 2020. So this was the most recent um, aerial photo of the the old dam before it was taken down. You can see down at the bottom that's the uh, the outfield fence of one of the um, baseball fields. Um, here's a few pictures I took back in the winter of 2020 of the dam. Um, you can kind of see it. There's a lot of water coming through here. Um, I don't know exactly when this photo was taken, but I think it was towards the end of winter when a lot of the snow melt was running off. So you can see there's like a considerable amount of water in, in the creek. Um, the dam is about 90 feet long from bank to bank, and it's about five feet high um, across. So, you know, a longer stretch of dam, but as far as height goes, not, not huge. Um, before we get into the details on the project, I did want to acknowledge all the kind of stakeholders and, and players that, that we worked with on this project, um, mainly down here in the left corner, New York Rising and the Governor's Office of Storm Recovery. That was where the funding came from. So I know, um, you know, you guys are probably interested in, in how to fund some of these projects. And I know a lot of what Megan is going to talk or had, had mentioned deals with aquatic organism passage, but uh, I do think, you know, it sounds like to me there is a lot of... Um, a lot of funding available like in regards to the actual flooding issues that are, can be caused by these dams which can kind of be a, um, a benefit to you know to both the organisms and and the communities um obviously dec was involved army corps of engineers was a um a kind of they, they help with the permanent as well under the clean uh, or the water quality certification and um tectonic engineering was the um engineer and applicant um representing the, the town and village for the project so they were the ones that actually designed the removal, um, submitted the reports, and also hired the subcontractors to do the work. So before we get into the, the plans, I just wanted to give everyone kind of a, 
a basic rundown of the permitting that is required for a project like this. So, <clears throat> you know, in any project that we get an application for, we have to determine the jurisdiction the DEC would have. Um, for this one, the Muna Creek uh, is Class C. So Class C is actually um, not one of our um, protected waterway classes. So anything C and then a T in parentheses for trout or above um, <clears throat> is subject to our stream protection regulations. But since the Munda Creek is navigable, um, it is subject to Article 15 under um, another um, section called excavation and fill. So because of the, the work that they would be doing, they would be excavating and filling within the, uh, the navigable area of the uh, Munda Creek. Um, 401 water quality certification, like I mentioned before, is a joint permit with the Army Corps of Engineers. So that's something that we, basically um, look at concurrently with the Article 15 um, application. That is something that, um, that we basically check a box in the application. And essentially what that is doing is making sure the project is, um, is in line with the um, federal water quality standards and that the, the project um, won't, won't impact water quality. Um, Article 11 is our endangered and threatened species uh, regulations that we do screen projects for. Um, for this project, there were no um, nearby uh, known occurrences for any species, but um, you know that could be a case for another project. Um, so it's something just to keep an eye on if you're looking um, to do some uh, you know, screening or potential funding. And an example for that would be um, a lot of areas around the Hudson Valley have um, endangered bats, so Indiana bat, northern long ear bat, and in most cases, if a project is doing um, significant ground disturbance, especially tree clearing, we could limit time of year restriction work um, because of the, the known areas of those species. And the last um, permit is the SWIP. Um, that's just a construction permit that is um, typically administered through our division of water, but in this case, um, the village and town are MS4 communities, so they um, have that responsibility. And that's just a permit that's in place during construction. Once the project is complete, um, that permit um, is done. So here are the plans that were submitted to us from Tectonic. Um, I'll try and point out some of the highlights here. And if anyone has any questions you know, after the presentation, I could certainly share some of this information with you. Um, but let's start on the left-hand side. Um, so the dam, you can see the whitewater rapids like right underneath the line here. Um, there are so a couple of important things to point out here. So on the left-hand side, we've got what looks like about four half circles. So two on the uh, eastern bank, or I guess the right bank, and then left uh, two circle, two half circles on the left bank. Those circles are basically the limits of a turbidity curtain that is to be placed in the creek uh, during the work um, to help prevent the migration of sediment downstream. So I don't know if everybody here knows what a turbidity curtain is, but it's basically like a, um, a, a piece of fabric that goes into the water that sits on weights um, and the fabric can, um, will help catch the sediment that is being released from the construction. So in this case, the major activity in those areas would be um, behind the dam, the project was proposing to um, excavate a bunch of sediment that had built up over the years. Um, so that kind of, there's like a, a line that goes behind the dam almost in like a triangular shape. That's the area of sediment removal. It says it kind of calls it out on the right hand side. Um, that material is going to be removed and, um, and stored in an upland area. And then likewise, on the other side of the dam, there was an area where there was a scour hole that had formed over time um, below the dam where they were gonna be filling that in with some, some heavier um, rock material to, to try and bring the grade back up to the normal um, stream, stream, bank, or stream bed elevation. And then obviously the removal of the dam itself. So those turbidity curtains were gonna act in a series of, of uh, like stages to help, help try and um, catch as much sediment as possible. And then on the right-hand side, um, you see the concrete dam called out across the creek. Um, the thing I wanted to point out here was that in addition to those turbidity curtains, there was gonna be a temporary uh, rock work platform that would go out into the, into the stream. And that would be just uh, so that equipment could reach the areas to excavate as well as the dam to start pulling down the pieces of concrete. Um, this is the restoration plan. So um, 
and I think I should have mentioned this in the last slide, but the, the area towards the top of the screen is the upstream side and it's flowing down, down the screen. You can see the arrow down here on the bottom. Um, so this kind of um, slashed area on the outskirts and the upland areas of the stream, those would be seeded um, for restoration purposes once all the construction was complete. And then this area that's kind of a darker gray that's in the stream, that's kind of on the edges of the stream, those would be planted with a series of plugs of different species that can um, survive in, in that location. Um, I did include a, a table of a, a, the planting guide. So the submergent vegetation would be the, the plugs and then the perimeter would be the seed mix. Um, so before we get into the, the pictures, I wanted to give everyone an idea of like some of the concerns and questions we would have um, looking at a project like this. So, Mainly the water quality was our major concern in maintaining water quality. We often, and I'd say maybe 90% of the time, try to um, have projects in stream, in stream projects done um, in the dry. So basically they would be pumping around uh, the water uh, around the work site or putting some kind of coffer dam um, in between the work area and the actual stream um, for a number of different reasons that was complicated to do here. Um, so we did work with the applicant to try and get a safer and um, hopefully environmentally friendly project that, uh, that, that could be done in the water during like while there was water going through the work area, which is not something that's very common for us, I will admit. Um, construction methods, like what we talked about earlier, and then another thing that um, I didn't really think about until we were looking through the project was possible contamination of the sediment um, that was built up behind the dam. So we did screen the site for any um, nearby locations to Superfund and Brownfield sites. Um, didn't find anything super close by, but we did also understand that, you know, this dam has been there since I think it was in the 1800s they thought it was built. Um, <clears throat> and you know, over time, who knows where that material is coming from. So that was one of the reasons why the material was removed from behind the dam. Um, it was going to be tested afterwards. Um, I do not have the results of that information, but the bottom line was the material was not put back into the creek. Um, a couple like back and forth. I mean, one thing to understand here is that this process is really a, truly a back and forth between DEC and the um, permit um, app application uh, applicator um so one of the things we asked for was shifting the, the spoils of the um that were being removed behind the dam to be outside of the wetland buffer there is a dec wetland um near the site and where they had originally proposed the material would be within 100 feet of the wetland so we had them remove or move that area that location um we had them remove some geotextile that was supposed to um, go underneath the rock platform. Oftentimes we see that geotextile um, get torn up and eventually end up downstream um, and can cause issues um, just getting snagged on trees and everything like that. So we had them remove the geotextile from underneath the rock platform. Um, we had them kind of walk us through in a little more detail the feasibility of in-water work versus working in the dry like I talked about before. Um, but ultimately, they did provide some information as far as like the average stream throw flows there and the width of the stream that you know didn't really make sense or even feasible to to actually dry out the work area to, to remove the dam. And as we usually typically do with these applications, we do ask for a pretty thorough alternatives analysis, um, which was provided by the applicant. Just to give you a timeline of this process, um, the application came in in the fall of 2019. We sent the first notice of incomplete application back to the applicant in uh, November of 2019. Then uh, we received a response from the applicant um, to that incomplete application notice in February of 2020. Uh, we sent the notice of complete application on March 23rd of 2020, which uh, that date probably jumps out at you. So that was probably the week that our entire um, you know, operation kind of shut down for a little while due to COVID. Um, so the permit did take a little while to get issued. Um, it was issued in June of 2020. And then the construction of the, or I guess removal of the dam began in October of 2020. Um, just to give everyone an idea here, there are a number of conditions that we include on the permit that 
uh, help basically the, the project move along and make sure that it is le as least impactful as possible. Um, turbidity curtains, uh, uh, we actually required a monitor to monitor for turbidity during the removal. So that way, if there was a large release of turbidity, they could um, stop work and, and adjust the, the erosion sediment controls as needed. Um, progress reports were required to be sent to DEC during the project. And then um, the plantings to be done along the bank um, were something that we, I think they had um, suggested that originally, but something that we probably would have required regardless as a restoration. Um, this is a quick screenshot of what the permit looks like. Um, if anyone's interested, these permits are public documents, so you can FOIL for, um, for this information if you have any, uh, um, any questions or just would like to look at it. Um, but pretty, pretty general information, location, number, et cetera. So here we'll come back to the location. So that yellow highlighted path, that's a, a work access for all the trucks and equipment. Um, once the yellow line got onto the baseball field, they actually did bring in timber mats. So, um, and that was, I'm assuming they didn't want to turf up their park and baseball field, but that was, um, that was nice to see that they brought those in. And then the red area was the soil stockpile where the um, material was removed from behind the dam and stored also on a timber mat. Um, and then the green was the approximate work area in the creek. So here's the photos, um, the best ones I could find of the actual removal. Um, so they did have two different types of equipment working kind of concurrently with each other. Um, the, the orange uh, equipment had a, it was a long reach excavator that was mainly removing the material from behind the dam. Um, and I believe they were also like putting the, the larger pieces back in the scour hole once the, once the dam was removed. And then the yellow machine was the actual hammer that was breaking up the, con the concrete pieces. So again, here's the, um, here's the dam previously. And then here's what it looked like in April of 2021. So about six months after the construction was done, you can see the there's still a silt fence up here on the left hand side, right next to the uh, the baseball. Although now that I'm looking at it, that could be a shadow but, <laughs> of the fence, but that is like the area where they were coming down and accessing the the creek. And this is a photo, uh, the most recent photo I had, aerial photo from uh, April of 2022. Um, they did leave some of the uh, the abutments that were on the side, um, but it's really, really hard to see those, especially now that it's been overgrown. Uh, here's a picture that I took recently of the area. So I'm looking downstream. The dam probably would have been uh, another 50 feet downstream of where my photo is, um, but you can kind of get the idea of, of that it is pretty much uniform as far as the surface water goes. Uh, so some takeaways from the project, um, you know, I think I said it before, but one thing that I was trying to think about during the permitting of this project was that, yes, the town, um, you know, it was really coming to us because this is a flood issue in the town, but um, we've done a lot of trainings and, and there is a lot of good work done by people like Megan and Nack and, and across the, the region that deal with aquatic organism passage. So um, this was kind of a, you know, a win-win for, for both the community and, and the DEC from an environmental standpoint. Um, In-water work can be done um, carefully, of course. There, again, there are not many projects we permit that allow for this much in-water work, but when you're doing something like this, there's not really another way to do it. So, um, and I would say for the most part, this was a successful um, project in regards to the, the way the work was done. Um, details are important and an open and easy dialogue with the applicant. I mean, this was, uh, back and forth, you saw the timeline over the course of, of you know, at least six to eight months with the applicant um, and just asking, you know, general questions about the construction and, and things like that. And it, it just made it really easy because there was never any arguing or any, you know, questioning. It was always a very open and, and beneficial conversation. Um, one other thing, though, I know the community, you know, did, uh, did want to do this for flood mitigation. This was um, clearly not a, really a permanent solution to like the major flooding. You know, I think one thing that would be interesting to look into would be to see, I guess, what size floods um, maybe this has helped. But as you can see here, um, it maybe didn't um, do, I don't know, it's just it didn't do as much as it could have. But this was in uh, Hurricane Ida back in the fall, uh, I believe, of last year, this was. 
So um, this is the entire baseball field still underwater. Um, you can see that gap in the trees. That's actually probably one of the access points to get into the creek. I don't think that's where they got in. I think where they went in was a little further down the stream. But you can see that village behind there. Um, I included some helpful links, um, just some stuff I, I thought was helpful. There's an entire like 100 plus page report on the village of Washingtonville and um, through New York Rising, which one of the recommendations through that was to remove the dam. Uh, interestingly enough, some of the other recommendations that I found were just to completely remove the baseball fields and go somewhere else. Um, there was a couple other recommendations that I'm sure cost a lot more money, but maybe down the road, the village might entertain. Um, and some state resources, New Hampshire had a really good website uh, about just general information on dam removal and restoration. And um, obviously DEC and NAC both have some great information. Um, that's all I have. So I appreciate the time and I guess we'll take questions in the Q&A. So thank you. Great, thanks so much, Mike, for your presentation. We're gonna hand it over next to Suzette Lopain from Westchester County Planning Department. And we will take questions for both presenters at the end, just a reminder to use that Q&A box if you have questions during the talks. Okay, thanks so much, Mike, on to Suzette. Hi, everyone, sorry about that. So, um, yeah, that's that's fantastic, Michael. Thank you so much. I, I love to see something that's actually built. So uh, we're not there yet. Um, we've just kind of started this process um, here in Worcester County. We're kind of looking at um, any opportunities for barrier removal. And so I'm kind of going to go through some of the, you know, kind of the starting point of, of uh, implementation for these projects. So um, again, I'm Suzette Lopain. I'm a landscape architect here at the County of Westchester. I work in the planning department. Um, my background is um, I, I build a lot of small projects in low-income neighborhoods, uh, parks and playgrounds especially. But you know, I became a little bit more interested in this subject. Um, kind of the initiator uh, for me was Riverkeeper, um, in particular, George Jackman uh, approached me with a project, and that's the one we'll be discussing today. That's Maiden Lane Dam. And um, so, yeah, so, you know, here in this picture that I'm showing, just, just to say, I mean, I think all of us uh, novices who aren't thinking about fish passage even, you know, this is really beautiful. I mean, it's a waterfall. It's gorgeous. You know, and and certainly there are waterfalls in our in our natural environment um, that have that are, are naturally there, or maybe the beavers built. And I think those are great. But um, here in Westchester County, at least, I see we have a lot of structures that um, perhaps you know it's it's time to look at them and and say whether or not that aesthetic is really um, the only aesthetic that we should have in our river systems. And maybe we should be thinking about getting rid of some of those. So here in, in, in Westchester County, um, uh, which was very much developed um, in the 1920s, we did build a lot of, of waterfall structures in our creeks. Um, this picture is actually Tibbetts Brook Park, which was built in the 1920s. Um, and so that was built for aesthetics. But we also have a, a long history and tradition of, of these run of river dams that um, served as uh, power sources and 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 created reservoirs for drinking water. And a lot of times these these um, structures have not been removed over time. and uh, you know we need to take a look and say, hey, maybe we should be removing these. these these are not serving a purpose anymore and they will return the stream to its natural um, uh, movement of sediment and allowing fish passage up and down the stream corridor. Um, so that's kind of where we're at now. We're looking at these structures. And, 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 and frankly, from, a, from the perspective of a, a municipality, um, the maintenance of these structures can be uh, quite um, a, a costly affair and need to be done many times, multiple times over time. And removal will simply eliminate that kind of uh, cost and maintenance responsibility for the local municipalities. So, um, you know, again, in this picture, this this is in Tibbetsbrook Park, and this was actually created for um, for for ice skating. Really, that was the purpose. It was a recreation use. 
so currently I'll just briefly go through this, this slide. These are kind of some projects that are we are working on now in implementation. None of these have been built. Uh, the first one, I would say in Sawmill River, that's it's um, kind of located right in where this star is on this map. That's Woodlands Lake Dam. That is in construction right now. And I'll show you some slides of that uh, later on where, where we are with that. The one I'm going to be sp speaking about mostly today would be in this area, this star at the top of the map. That's that's on the Furnace Brook, also known as the Jamawissa, if we do rename that, the Jamawissa River was the uh, Native American name for that uh, stream system there. And it's been called the Furnace Brook since the probably the middle, mid 1800s. We're also working on another project. This is an, as a partnership with the town, town of Newcastle that's located here. That uh, is called the Upper Minkle Dam and Dyke. And that project was actually a, is actually a, a lake that was created to make ice blocks, ice blocks, yes. So, you know, we, we really, really uh, implemented a lot of different types of, of projects in, in our streams that now, obviously we don't need to make ice blocks anymore in our stream. So the last one I would mention, which is probably, that's the first one I got involved with the Pelham Lake Dam that's down in the in the Long Island Sound. We're still working to try to um, remove this dam. And again, these all have challenges and, and take it takes time to get these things implemented. And it's for good reason. We need to make sure that we're doing the right thing and we're doing it in the right uh, me me method. So this was really the first actual implementation that I that I have done. This was a really small structure. And th this project was initiated by uh, George Jackman over at Riverkeeper. And this, this particular structure is located, I think it's maybe like, I wanna say a half a mile to a quarter mile below the Maiden Lane Dam, which is the project we'll be discussing in more detail. And so, this this dam was removed basically in a day. A contractor came with his machines. He mobilized. He went down the slope. He removed the stone. It was probably only a couple of feet tall. And and lo and behold, we now had a uh, fish passage in in this portion of the creek. And I would mention to you that if you notice, this is very this this portion of the creek is filled with a lot of stone and cobble. Th this portion is sediment starved because of the dam up, upstream that we will be removing. And um, here you have us, we are planting the, um, the slope that the contractor used to get his equipment down. This is me over here, uh, Megan Lung um, worked with us. I, I don't have, she, unfortunately she's not in the picture, but she, she was, she's been to this site many times with me. It was a, a great partnership. We did have to work with the town to get the town to give us a permit for the road. But uh, I would just say to everyone out there who's thinking and contemplating doing some of these projects, partnership is super, super important. We all need to work together to try to get these things done, whether it's um, the, the scientists at the DEC, whether it's our not-for-profits such as Riverkeeper, Save the Sound. Is, I've also worked with them on these, these types of projects, but we all have to work together, the local municipalities, because we all have a, a piece of the pie that, that is very important to this project. So right now, just, just so you know where we're at, so we're, we're working very intensely on these two projects, the Furnace Brook Maiden Lane and the Upper Mankel. The Furnace Brook will be going into the permitting portion of this project. So uh, the DEC and the Army Corps are going to be involved with the permits on this project. And one thing that has recently, within the last two years, been implemented in terms of permitting is what they call the pre-application phase. And uh, that's super helpful for us to understand what needs to happen in terms of the permitting and give us some um, guidance and direction, but, but also informing the regulatory agencies what we plan on doing. And it just helps to get everybody on the same page the uh, Upper Minkle Dam, we're a little bit farther behind on, on that project. And um, that that one, we're, we're having issues with, with access. As, as Michael had pointed out in the Moon Creek, you know, the access is super important to be able to get the equipment in there and not to damage the land surrounding. So yeah, those can be challenges all the way through. 
So this is a picture of the existing Maiden Lane Dam. The the structure is again, it's it's beautiful. You know, it really looks looks has a very attractive appeal to it. But over time, you know, this structure is starting to fail. There are a lot of seepage um, seepages into here. This this dam is not um, considered a, a huge high flood hazard risk if it were to breach because it's very um, there's not a lot of uh, properties below this dam that would be affected. There is one bridge that would be affected, but certainly it's something to consider, you know, when you do remove these, these structures, if there were to be a, an unexpected breach, you know, that kind of failure, even if um, it's not going to cause uh, property damage or, or heaven forbid, um, a damage, uh, um, life, uh, a life-threatening kind of event, um, it still is something that has to be maintained according to the low, to the latest standards, and that can get very expensive. So removal is is definitely something should be considered as an option, and certainly something that when I have the opportunity to say to dam safety here and, uh, at the DEC, you know that should be uh, an alternative given for consideration for any kind of dam rehab project. Um, so this dam was built in the 1800s. It was built when the the property in question was an estate it was for aesthetics it was for you know um just to be able to look at a, a pond and impoundment behind so that was kind of the the intent and purpose of that 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 dam structure these this estate is no longer there the area is um heavily vegetated and um, returning it to the a natural creek is um, definitely something that is is going to um, enhance the aesthetic rather than detract from it. And also, it's going to, to provide that fish passage. And in terms of that that enhancement of the landscape, I would say that the the impoundment behind this dam is very filled with sediment. So in this in the spring and into the summer, uh, there's a lot of nutrient accumulation behind this. Dam, and so I'm sure all of you have seen this kind of st stagnant water, just covered with, you know, kind of this green algae. Um, it's it's not very attractive, and and the only way to really uh, remove that would be to uh, either remove the dam or to dredge the sediment. And we can talk about that some more, but that becomes a huge cost if if that were um, desired. So this is just a, a map of the area, just so you have some sort of an idea of what, what we're talking about. So the dam is located here, and I'm sorry, I, I didn't, I forgot to label this, but um, the highway uh, Route 9 is here. There's a culvert here uh, that passes the, the, the Furnace Creek underneath the, the highway. That is the beginning of, that's the upstream portion of our project area, the, it, this is the impoundment, comes around, there's the dam. The dam that we removed, oh my goodness, I think it's right about here. And then the creek comes down and meets the Hudson River here. It does pass, let's see, there's a bridge structure here and there's a culvert here underneath the Metro North uh, Railroad tracks, but this is the Hudson River here. So that's kind of, um, the lay of the land. And I would like to say here that um, um, our implementer of this project, uh, Princeton Hydro, um, particularly um, Paul Woodworth, has been a great um, person, uh, firm to work with. They have educated me on this process and certainly are going to guide, guide us in this. Um, Paul is a fluvial geomorphologist, is really kind of the um, is an important partner to to work with to determine you know what is going to happen behind here in terms of of that landscape and the way that um the 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 dam removal is going to affect the the landscape in this location and and uh, philosophically i would say that it, 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 it is something that you want to kind of allow the river to show you what's going to happen and part of the background that um princeton hydro did to determine, you know, what is going to happen in this impoundment area was a series of, of sediment probes to know what is the consistency of that sediment and um, how is it going to, to flow once this dam is fully removed. And in terms of that, I would say 
that um, in the in the, with the dam removal, what what actually is is going to happen is we, we're going to do this over a, a period of time. It's going to be slow. The dam is going to be notched one, you know, one and through maybe five different iterations. So slowly this dam is going to come out. There will be some sediment transport, natural sediment transport through that notch that will go back into the Hudson River. Because as we all know, our, our stream systems, that's naturally what happens with sediment. When we put dam structures in there, that sediment gets trapped behind that dam. That is not natural. So there will be some natural sediment transport that will happen. We're also planning on doing some um, excavation of the so soil material. That material will be placed in spoil locations, um, uh, kind of within this wooded area. There, there are some places where we'll be able to spoil that sediment. Um, you know, right now, just so you have some ideas of, of some of the, the challenges that we're having on this particular project, we do uh, hope to get, fingers crossed, we'll do permits at the end of the year. Uh, but one of the challenges we have is this, this culvert up here. Um, DOT has an easement here. So recently we've started a partnership with DOT to try to work out funding as well as implementation of fish passage at this culvert. And so, you know, hopefully that's going to um, come to fruition. I'd also like to say um, that we have on, on the call, we do have Akiko Bush. She did walk this site with me. She is an author. And um, we, we did some investigation of the, the tree materials. I, I did some um, tree ID for uh, Princeton Hydro on this project. And uh, it was great to have her here as a, as a, as a partner. Again, it's, it's, it's just super important to have partners on all these types of projects. So I just wanted to kind of give you a, a picture of an implemented project. This is actually uh, up near where I live in Dutchess County. And there was a dam called the McKinney Dam. It's a privately owned dam. And it decided to notch itself. And um, a hole formed in the base of the dam and the lake behind it just disappeared. And you were left with a creek bed and uh, a large floodplain area. And here, this is a uh, planting we did, um, Trees for Tribs, uh, during the pandemic. And, um, you know, that was, it was, it was exciting to be a, a volunteer and a part of that as well. And then I would just say, um, in parting. So this is uh, the Woodlands Lake Dam. This is an impoundment area. This is what it looks like before you do the planting, while you're doing the construction, while you are looking at uh, drying out that sediment behind the dam structure. Um, this is kind of, this is what it, what it, what it looks like during that, that period of time. And it's interesting, you, you can start to see uh, where the stream would would tend to course through through that sediment. And that's something that you'd want to preserve. You want to allow the stream to do what it wants to do in terms of either braiding, if it wanted to, to do that, or if it wanted to channelize in a particular location and meander, those are important to allow that stream um, to, to do that. And then this looser material that would definitely transport in a storm when this is filled you know, you really have to look at, you know, what what do you what do you want to allow to go down the stream and what actually should be spoiled out of out of the um floodplain. So yeah, I um that's uh that's that's what I have for you. And uh thank you so much and uh thanks for everybody getting up early and uh it's, it's great to make this presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Suzette. It's really exciting to hear about all of the momentum that you've built in Westchester County on these projects and um, particularly hearing about the different stages of these dam removal projects. We know it's a long and complicated, but also a very exciting process. So unsurprisingly, we have some excellent questions in the Q&A. Um, and I wanna start off with a question, I think for Mike, about the role of the US Army Corps of Engineers in the permitting process. Um, since DEC and, and these streams sometimes have a federal nexus with US Army Corps of Engineers, do the recent changes and unknowns about federal navigable waters definitions affect New York State dam removal projects? Um, that's a good question. So as far as the jurisdiction goes for the Army Corps, um, 
it it's as the person said it's it's changing all the time and usually if that question comes up we the easiest way to do that is to have the applicant submit a jurisdictional determination form or application to the army corps because we you know we have a hard enough time trying to maintain our jurisdiction so <laughs> it's really hard especially when they change all the time to um to 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 be, be able to say you know how the core would would take a project um so i guess the short answer is yes it could but how you know we don't know great thank you um are the impoundments above dams assessed for the importance to breeding or migratory waterfowl? I could try my best to answer that one, Emily. Um, so I can't speak uh, specifically, Lynn, but I will say like in general, you know, with dam removal, because like putting a dam in a river is a big deal that impacts a lot of factors um, with our natural environment. So certainly like if there is a species of importance, um, the DEC has resources where you can look through our natural resource mapper where that might flag important habitat, but that's part of a larger conversation to have about, you know, the, the positives and negatives and um, on dam removal. I would just like to make the point Matt, that the, sorry, make the point, I mix the word point and impoundment together. Ooh, early day. Um, but these impoundments that are created, they're not natural, they're not permanent. So with all dams, all dams eventually come down either they are maintained and they are removed in a removed in a controlled manner or they fail in, in an uncontrolled manner. So it's important to also consider that these impoundments are not permanent. They do have to be maintained and there is a cost to that maintenance sometimes. Not sometimes, all the time there is cost. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Megan. Um, I know that in the Q&A, Mike has answered a bunch of questions, but I wanted to go back to the question about the um, the flood mitigation priority of the, the project on the Moodna Creek and the analysis conducted that uh, looked at the extent to which the dam was contributing to flooding of homes and businesses. I know this project was a part of the New York Rising process and they did some kind of a flood study. And I'm wondering how that may have interacted with the plans and permits that were submitted as part of the removal process. Sure, um, they definitely did submit a uh, lengthy information. I'm sure they just pulled it out of that report that basically was justifying the removal of the dam related to the, the homes and businesses. Um, I couldn't tell you off, off the top of my head what, what those numbers were, but I do know looking through the report a couple of times in the past week, there were, there were numbers in there and, and information about um, not just this dam and how it impacts the, those things, but other uh, infrastructure within the village. Um, so yeah, that was definitely short answer would just be that that was basically the justification for for um, you know moving forward with the project. Thanks, Mike. A uh, question for Suzette. Um, there's a comment thanking you for addressing the aesthetics of dam removal because this often seems to be a driver of public opposition to dam removal. Uh, what has your experience with these projects taught you about these concerns and how to address them constructively? Yeah, so great question. I would just say, you know, in terms of that of that thought process, we are starting with things that are kind of what I would call low-hanging fruit in terms of, of, of public perception. I think we need to start implementing some of these so that people can see what happens. You know, it is important to recognize the aesthetic value is certainly that people uh, perceive, but there is an aesthetic value to having the, the impoundment removed. Again, because of this sediment uh, buildup, these impoundments are becoming filled and clogged with, with nutrients, which is causing this kind of, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, generically say it's all green algae, but it, it's definitely creating kind of a scum layer on top of these ponds. And that's not going to stop unless the dam is removed or the sediment is, is, is taken out. And taking out sediment can cost millions. It is extremely expensive. So, so in my own, just my regular construction projects, I'm paying hundred dollars a yard for um, sediment or just excavation for my sidewalks. I mean, hundred dollars a yard, Five years ago, I was paying twenty. So, you know, when you're talking about excavating thirty thousand yards out for for a pond in a, a run of river situation, it's just economically it's untenable. We 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 have to think about the fact that we can't continue to dredge anymore. 
Thank you. And then we have a couple questions about the status of the McKinney Pond Dam that you mentioned. Are there any plans to eventually remove that dam that had been breached? I know there was a Trees for Tribs restoration project there. What's the current status? Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't really uh, kept up with that. I mean, certainly when we did the Trees for Tribs, the discussion was that that was probably going to stay in place. The the cost of of removing that for the homeowner would would have been um, extreme. Um, Megan may may be able to uh, discuss a little bit more about getting funding for those types of things on private property, but that's been a real issue. You know, so these structures, these dam structures that are on private property, it's not easily it's not easy to fund those types of things. And I think that's a challenge for all of us. And I think we should uh, keep that in mind in the future. Yeah, Megan, go ahead. Oh, thank you. I use my raise hand function. Um, yeah, so to add to that, you know, for a lot of um, state and federal funding, a private landowner is not eligible. However, it is possible for a municipality or like a soil and water uh, district or a nonprofit like Riverkeeper or Save the Sound to apply on the landowner's behalf. Um, and Dutchess County Soil and Water was successful with that in 2016 with removing um, a private dam on the East Branch of the Wappinger Creek. The Soil and Water District applied on behalf of the owner and was able to bring that down. Great, thanks, Megan. And while, while you've got the mic, I'm wondering if you can also elaborate a little bit on this question of who pays for the preparation of permits and the huge construction task of excavation. And Suzette's comments about the cost of sediment moving and removal, I think really speaks to these high costs and how we think about where the funding can come from for the planning, for the permits, for the actual construction as well. Yeah. So, and I absolutely recognize, you know, the cost is a huge barrier to getting these projects started, but um, there, it, there is a lot of funding, you know, with the infrastructure bill, and there's also um, habitual state funding that has been available that can cover um, things like the construction, the permit, you can, all, you can account for that in your application for grant funding. Um, you know, in particular, the harbor, the New York, New Jersey Harbor Estuary Program has been writing letters to federal partners addressing the um, high cost of doing projects in our region. So, you know, trying to address things as match, but there are things that municipalities or um, nonprofits can do also to account and come up with that match percentage. So perhaps it's less um, cash match, but it's more of um, in-kind services or project management, or if you can get together a group of volunteers um, like, like Suzette and George Jackman from Riverkeeper did in the restoration piece of that to show that contribution. So um, you have something to provide to the funders. And then my shorter answer would be like, absolutely, please get in contact with us. Um, it's very challenging to get through funding resources and that's what we're here to do is help. Great, thank you. Um, just looking through these questions, there's been a lot of great responses, uh, typed responses to some of your questions. Um, so make sure you open that Q&A box and take a look at that. Um, and just checking, where did that one go? Um, there was a question on the decision to remove the sediment and if sediment removal would have been required if it was determined in advance that it was not contaminated. So Mike, wondering, I, I know you wrote an answer to that around um, preventing migration of that built up sediment downstream, but uh, if you could speak a little bit more to some of that sed sediment removal considerations. Sure, and I think, um... Maybe I wasn't clear on this when they when I went through the project. The sediment removal was always part of the plan um, that was presented to us originally, and I think um, you know, look, asking the applicant, we were more concerned about um, you know potential contamination of the sediment um, because of the removal. So, um, like I answered in the in the chat, the the actual physical removal I, I think was mainly just to prevent that sediment because a lot of the sediment that builds up behind the dams is the finer, more like smaller great, uh, you know, size um, material. So trying to prevent that from running downstream because that would essentially just cause a plume of turbidity. And I would imagine just from a construction standpoint, that would be helpful to, to remove that buildup as well. Um, but one thing that we did, um, basically have them, well, we suggested, and they sound like they were already planning to do this anyway, was to have that material tested once it was removed, because essentially what that does is you can, there's a permit through DEC called a beneficial use determination, uh, or known as a BUD permit. And if, if that material is clean, um, they can use it 
um, like on site. So let's say they had an area of the baseball field they needed to regrade or something, they could use it there. But if it comes back contaminated with, I don't know the different materials, but if it comes back with certain materials, it has to be disposed of at a proper um, facility. So that was one of the concerns that we had, just knowing how these streams move and not knowing where the material was coming from. Great, thank you so much. And, and thank you to Megan, Mike, and Suzette for your presentations today, uh, covering a lot of ground, uh, learning all about the different aspects of dam removal, some of these considerations, and also some of the funding sources. So thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, hope you have a great day, happy holidays, and we'll see you next month for our next breakfast lecture. <laughs>